So let's talk briefly about attacker motivations. Why would someone go and infect a firmware? In short, the answer is real ultimate power. Realistically, the firmware is typically the most privileged software on the system. And so there are certain nation states and certain adversaries who typically like to take up residence at that most powerful position on the system. There's others who are just fine with running around down in user space and, you know, they can get the job done that way too. So to understand why the infection of firmware leads to real ultimate power, we have to understand how computers actually do useful things. Well, it starts typically with the firmware and the firmware configures the hardware, hands off to something like a bootloader, which is going to load a more full featured system like an operating system or a hypervisor. And that's going to then control the resources throughout the rest of the power on cycle of the system. And it's going to load things like applications which do the actual useful things. It's generally speaking, you know, the databases, the word processors, those are the things that are actually doing useful stuff. So the history of attacks is that attackers had started creating malicious software at the application level. Defenders started creating defensive software which would catch the malicious software at the application level. And then attackers got the bright idea that, hey, if I just move one level up, then I'm going to have more power and privilege than the defensive software and I will be able to defeat it. And the defensive software saw that and said, well, I guess I need to get up there too. And that way they can defeat the malware. And that process continued back and back and back until you finally get to the firmware level. But unfortunately, as of today, architecturally, the attacker wins down at the firmware level. Once you get to something where it's the same privileged software, you know, fighting over the same resources, then it's really just a question of, you know, who wants it more, who knows more about the other software in order to defeat it. And then when it comes to detecting malicious software, one of these things is not like the other. So applications, operating systems, hypervisors, and even bootloaders are all just what we think of as normal software, which just runs and lives on a hard drive or an SSD. On the other hand, firmware is something that is typically stored in a non-volatile flash memory on a motherboard. It's typically, you know, soldered down to some circuit board somewhere. And so that means even trying to detect this software, you know, you could hope to find something in a bootloader by just doing hard drive firmware forensics, but you can't hope to find malicious software down at the firmware level by doing that sort of approach. And as of today, robust software to do firmware forensics is very much in its infancy. So even if companies wanted to detect it, very often they don't have good options to do that. Unfortunately, today, the only truly trustworthy way to detect or mitigate the infection down at the firmware level is to actually physically attach to flash chips and rewrite the contents or read the contents for detection purposes. And if malware got into the system through the traditional means, you know, coming in from the internet and then spreading around inside the network, well, if it gets down to this level, it would be extremely costly and time consuming to actually try to recover from it. So again, why would someone want to infect the BIOS? Well, it's free pass to persistence forever. They can get down to that deepest level and it's extremely hard to dig them out. Attackers know that very few organizations are actually checking down at the BIOS level and consequently they can pretty much guarantee that if they can get there, they can live on the systems for years on end. So then is hacking the BIOS the end goal in and of itself? Well, probably not. They probably want to get down to some other portion of the system, such as the kernel or applications where interesting stuff goes on, keystrokes come in, application data is processed, and then collect the information from there. And so what can an attacker really do once they infect BIOS? Well, the answer is they can do anything that the system can do because they have the full power and privileges of the system. Indeed, they who run first run best. So let's see some quick examples of that. Well, you could infect the BIOS and then you could actually just brick it, as we say. You corrupt the firmware and rendering the system a brick. It won't boot anymore. And in reality, it's actually only required to change a single byte of the firmware and you can successfully make the system never boot again. This was actually seen in the CIH virus back in 1998. And although Wikipedia says that it infected 60 million systems, I find that number a little bit dubious given the spreading techniques that were available at the time. Nevertheless, it was, you know, an extremely bad day for anyone who had their system bricked.
Then there's the BIOS backdooring. Like we already said, an attacker starting from the BIOS can infect their way down to the bootloader because they load the bootloader, which can in turn infect the operating system because the bootloader loads the operating system, which can in turn infect the applications, which do the interesting stuff. This was in fact caught in the wild in 2011 in some Chinese systems where malware was infecting the BIOS and then it was bouncing its way down to attack the rest of the system. Another thing an attacker could do is what I call an uber evil made attack. In a traditional evil made attack, a attacker infects the bootloader and then captures the full disk encryption password when someone logs into their system. Now we said before that a bootloader is actually just software running on the hard drive and consequently it's vulnerable to detection through normal hard drive forensics. So if an attacker actually lives back on the spy flash chip where nobody's checking, then they can just in memory only infect the bootloader so that it's not vulnerable to hard drive forensics. And then they can just go ahead and capture the hard drive password as an attacker, as a uh, person logs into their own system. And then at that point they can, you know, go capture the full hard drive contents and decrypt it at their leisure. Or of course they can make their way into the operating system as normal. When BIOS infection is applied to more of a server or virtualization infrastructure, it means they can play the exact same game going from the BIOS to a bootloader to a hypervisor, and then they can infect every virtual machine that that hypervisor is managing. And so you've got all the eggs in one basket and they can go ahead and smash or steal the eggs. So this of course would be a problem for you know large virtualization infrastructure providers. Now between 2006 and 2009, Jonah Rakowska and her colleagues at Invisible Things Labs had done investigation into different ways to attack the system at ever more progressively lower levels. In 2006, with her blue pill research, she talked about using virtualization to as malicious software rather than just normal software in order to basically virtualize an operating system that was not expecting it and in so doing take control over all of the resources that it thought it was managing. So in that work, she coined the phrase ring negative one to indicate that this virtualization software was intrinsically more privileged than ring zero kernel software because again, Intel's convention was that higher ring numbers were less privileged and lower ring numbers were more privileged. So therefore ring negative one must be more privileged than ring zero. Later on, the team had found attacks on a system management mode, which they termed ring negative two, because they found that this was actually even more powerful than virtualization software. It had full control over all of memory, including the VMM's memory, and furthermore, it could not be directly inspected by the VMM. Also in 2009, they ultimately found an attack on the Intel, uh, what was at the time called Management Engine, later called the Converged Security and Management Engine. It's also called Active Management Technology. That was just the marketing term. And at the time, because of the architecture, it was the case that that particular location where the code ran uh, was on a processor that had full memory access. So it could inspect the otherwise uninspectable memory of system management mode. So these terms ring negative one, ring negative two, and ring negative three came into existence referring to ever deeper and more privileged code. And so obviously an attacker would like to go as privileged as possible. Now the situation is more complicated than that, and so I'm not going to actually use ring levels, but just, you know, to, to give you a sense of, you know, how these different privilege levels build up. So of course we have, you know, user space and root processes. Root, of course, is expected to be more privileged than use other user space processes, or admin processes are supposed to be more privileged. Then of course you have the kernel, which is more privileged still. And a typical privilege escalation attack would be trying to find your way, for instance, from a non-root process like a web browser all the way into the kernel, which consequently can you know, manage and compromise all other user space processes. Beyond the kernel, then of course there's virtualization technology, which could be more privileged than the kernel if it's a bare metal virtual machine. Otherwise, things that you're usually used to thinking about, such as VMware, those are actually not more privileged than the kernel. Those are just run as you know special combinations of you know kernel drivers and user space applications. 
So VMM more privileged, but then of course we have the bootloader, which wasn't talked about in this you know, original Rakowska taxonomy. And the bootloader must necessarily load either a bare metal virtual virtualization system or a kernel, you know, if a virtualization system doesn't exist. So we can say that you know, infection of a bootloader would necessarily lead to more privilege than a virtualization system. Then there's system management mode, which we'll be learning about in this class. But SMM gets a little bit complicated because there is a technology that is meant to actually virtualize SMM, so wrap a virtual machine around SMM. That's called the STM, or SMI Transfer Monitor, but in practice that's not typically used for reasons we'll see later. Now, modern systems also introduce the capability to deprivilege SMM. And so between a BIOS setting up SMM in a special way or new hardware extensions, it may be possible to deprivilege SMM to about the level of a kernel, possibly a peer to the kernel, or you could even deprivilege it even further so that it's less privileged than the kernel in most regards. And so it just kind of depends on how the particular system is set up. Then there's the BIOS, which is the code that runs first and sets up the SMM and loads the bootloader, which loads the subsequent things. And an extreme privilege escalation would be to make your way all the way from, you know, a root or admin privilege inside of, you know, ring three all the way up to the BIOS. And then you could control all of these systems thereafter. And this was, you know, the Invisible Things Labs work in 2009. And even further, Invisible Things Labs found their way to break from the kernel level all the way into the management engine. But once we start getting to this level, it turns out that the management engine is off on its own processor, and we can start to consider other things that are off on their own processor, like DMA-capable peripherals, so DMA, direct memory access. These are things typically out on the PCIe bus, which are capable of accessing arbitrary memory if it's not protected. So we, have to, we start to get a little bit uh, messier once we get down to this lowest level. So all of these things, the BIOS, SMM, bootloader, etc., these are all things that are executing on the actual CPU itself, the Intel CPU. The CSME and the DMA-capable peripherals are off on peripheral processors. So the CPU has mechanisms to defend itself against peripheral processors, and then it really becomes a question of, is the particular BIOS, SMM, bootloader, are those things using what's available in order to defend themselves, or can these external entities just arbitrarily and always get powered privilege access over them. One of the most important things to defend themselves is the Intel VTD technology, virtualization technology for directed I.O., also frequently known as an I.O. memory management unit. And this is the thing that can potentially defend against a DMA-capable peripheral. But it really becomes a question of what's in use. So if VTD is not protecting the BIOS, then a DMA-capable peripheral can potentially infect the memory of the BIOS as the system is booting early in boot. And so some systems, you know, most systems don't use uh, VTD at the level of the BIOS. Some systems actually do use it at the level of protecting a virtualization system so that malware can't just DMA its way into the hypervisor and take over that way. And other systems only use it to protect the kernel itself. And so either way, if the you know, protection is down here, then the attacker has the power of the earliest location that they can infect with this DMA type capability. And so this, for instance, was the case for Mac OS uh, before myself and my colleagues came and you know, pushed the VTD boundary all the way to cover the BIOS. And while it would be nice if I could say that because of Intel's VTD and other technologies that the CPU resident software and firmware is actually just always protected against these peripheral processors, things like the CSME ultimately complicate this because researchers like Positive Technologies have found that on some hardware, such as Intel Atom processors, the capability to enable hardware debugging is intrinsically linked to the CSME, so it can actually just always arbitrarily uh, take over control of the processor. You know, it's a hardware debugger, so they can, you know, set registers, read registers, write registers, and ultimately, you know, force the CPU to jump to some attacker-controlled code. There's also an open question about whether the CSME, just by virtue of the way that Intel has designed it, is able to bypass Intel VTD. This hasn't been shown yet, but it may be shown very soon in the future. And then while we have this picture up, it's worth mentioning things like 
Microsoft's approach of trying to use what they call Secure Launch, where they use Intel VTD to protect a virtualization system, their virtualization-based security. And they're also starting to use Intel TXT, Trusted Execution Technology. This is a technology that tries to say, I don't care whether all of this stuff up here is infected, I'm just going to relaunch my system into a nice clean state with some measured content, which then can protect things like your full disk encryption password so that you can't even get into the hard drive unless everything is measured and in the correct configuration. And they also you know, require BIOS vendors to use these SMM deprivileging mechanisms because historically it had been shown that SMM could always defeat this Intel TXT. So whether this approach will work or not will depend on further research in the areas of these low-level attacks and seeing whether they can bypass these Intel security technologies. And hopefully in the future we'll be providing classes on Intel VTD and Intel TXT in order to make it so that more people understand how these security defensive mechanisms work so that they can apply them to other operating systems, but also so that more people can do research on whether they actually work or whether they're bypassable through some mechanism or another. So I think it's important to make a distinction between architectural privilege and implemented privilege. Architecturally, a hardware maker like Intel might add some defensive technologies. They might add new features and new hardware, but it's ultimately the responsibility of firmware and software makers to adopt these features. So while BIOS makers could use VTD, it's been around for well over a decade, most of them don't. And while operating system makers could use virtualization in order to partition some of the more privileged functionality into a more isolated location, most of them don't. And even those who do, don't have the capability to implement it all the time on all the hardware and all the configurations. And so architects are always trying to further partition and jail and sandbox and isolate different chunks of privilege on the system. And so that means that you know rings ultimately are not the best way to convey what has what capabilities on the system. They're a good shorthand, but they fall very short in terms of actually providing you a meaningful description of what can do what. And the key point is that some attackers want the most power and privilege possible. And consequently, they're always going to be digging deeper and deeper into the system where most people don't look in order to find that power.